all good things have to come to an end. And after five days of what's been an amazing, exciting, action-packed IFA Congress at Basel, Switzerland, we are here for a review of the action, of all the action uh, of the last uh, four days of technical sessions and a little more, and two very, very, very special guests for us. Horus Kaka, the president of IFA, senior advocate at Bombay High Court, and a tax expert, and of course, the one and only inimitable Philip Baker. Philip, quotable quotes from you. First, how do you rate the four days of the Congress here, and what were the key takeaways for you? Well, I have to say that it was a good Congress, but of course I have to say, given the present company, it wasn't quite as good as Mumbai last year. <laughs> and, uh, it's been a very good Congress, and there are very large numbers of people. Everyone seems very happy with the discussions. We've had some interesting um, debates, um, lots of uh, good material, and lots of opportunity to meet old friends. Mm -hmm. The key takeaways, Philip? Oh, key takeaways. Well, I was one of the general reporters for the topic on um, the protection of taxpayers' fundamental rights. So um, my key takeaway would be that we had a very good reception and in particular a good recognition of the importance that increased powers for tax authorities must be balanced by really effective pr practical protections for taxpayers' rights. So that would be my takeaway. This was the Congress when IFA seriously examined practical protection of taxpayers' Before rights. Before I get to Porus here, because he gave the quote of the week to us there, do you think the message on taxpayer rights that you tried to deliver, do you think that message resonated with the regulators, the OECD, the US, other revenue officials? Did that resonate? Well, we in a sense weren't giving a message, we were doing a bit of academic research on best practice in countries on protection of taxpayers' rights and minimum standards. It's now for IFA branches, including governmental members of IFA branches, to take that away and to use the research that we've done in order to improve their practices on human rights. And if that happens, I'll be very happy. Boris. You said in your opening speech, the pendulum on debts will swing right back, though right now, currently it's in favor of the revenue. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, that's really a law of nature, nothing to do. But today in the debate, there is so much focus on what is perhaps slightly bad practices of a few, but the rules are being amended for the majority, and there are many good taxpayers amongst that majority. And here is where I think I would agree and slightly disagree with Philip is that if you are a main subject of an IFA, IFA panel, there is, there is the fact that you are up there in the, in the discussion. So I think putting things like the protection of taxpayer rights in the forefront of the debate is bound to draw attention. And I have heard back also so from several people at this that yes, this was a very opportune time to do this. There will be further discussions on this, I'm sure, in the years to come. Purus, uh, on BEPS itself, I mean, that was the topic at the center stage here. Uh, it's it's not, not just the 800-pound gorilla, but everyone's concerned about what we are going to see in the next 12 months. Before I go to Philip, how have you seen the process over the last 24 months pan out? You're happy with where we are, and where do you see it going over the next 12 months? And I'm sure IFA is going to continue to do a lot of work on BEPS. I don't think anyone can ignore BEPS. Whether I'm happy where I am, I, I, can, I cannot answer that question because so much of the work is still incomplete. I don't think anyone is ever going to be happy as to where, where we are finally. But uh, what I see the way forward is that, look, countries are doing things whether we have consensus or not. So I think it's critical that the OECD is able to get consensus and consensus in as objective a manner as possible with these wonderful subjective words like value and things like that floating around. On BEPS. On BEPS, um, nobody's surprised that it's you dominated. Are you less of a cynic? I wait to see. I mean, we've still got a couple of weeks before the second group of BEPS reports come out. I suspect that the final judgment will be that BEPS is a bit of like a curate's, curate's egg, 
there are good bits and bad bits. There are certainly bits of BEPS that I think are long overdue and uh, will be very good. One of them is the multilateral convention and I hope very much that that will push forward arbitration in tax matters and it will put that into many more tax treaties. There are other bits that um, one may be less um, happy with. Um, overall, what's interesting is not just the content of BEPS but also the procedure because countries have been involved who were not involved in the past, and that includes India. And once you've involved those countries, you can't say to them, excuse me, your temporary membership of the golf club in Paris has expired, you can't take part again um, there. Um, now we move towards totally inclusive discussion of international tax matters. And whether that means that we move from the OECD to the UN and the UN takes over this work, it seems to me to be a logical development. But what certainly you cannot do is now say to the countries that have actively participated, um, you're no longer going to take part in these discussions. And that's perhaps the most important long-term effect of this project. Uh, 12 months back, we were talking of a change in mindset when it came to BEPS. When you speak to a lot of uh, your clients, you speak to a lot of taxpayers, you interact with the government authorities, uh, you're, are you slowly seeing a change in mindset? Are people getting more geared up? Are all the stakeholders, are they more geared up for BEPS than they were 12 months back? I, I completely think that's going to happen. I think whether you have the stricter rules or you don't have the stricter rules, I think co corporates are being measured by a standard that's really unwritten right now, even if BEPS doesn't get written in the next few months. I mean, you just have to see. I mean, we already see Amazon already shifted publicly on certain countries in Europe. And I certainly do see across the board that corporates are extremely more careful in their tax planning strategies. And I think they are also looking at their existing structures, which are sometimes a legacy issue, and how to correct them going forward. Philip, you want to add to that? No, I um, think it's absolutely correct that uh, um, perhaps companies are not publicly saying that they are um, taking account of BEPS, but there's no doubt that privately um, they are considering what they need to do and that some of the things that have already been implemented are changing practices and that some of the multinationals um, are changing. I I'd like to um, echo um, and very much second something that uh, Pora said earlier, which is that BEPS is fundamentally driven by the conduct of a relatively small number of multinationals, very significant multinationals, but a relatively small number, but many of the changes affect everyone, and there is an immense amount of potential collateral damage, so that there will be people who are nowhere near being multinationals, but who will suddenly find an impact of it, and that, in a sense, may be one of the negative um, consequences of the BEPS project. Yep. I'll hand it over to Amai for a few minutes uh, for his take. Uh, Amai, what are your takeaways? You've covered almost all the sessions. So how would you rate the Congress uh, and how were the technical deliberations and what do you think stood out? Uh, I think in terms of the technical uh, content in the discussion, IFA Congress is always uh, par excellence, but this one is particularly uh, very high on the uh, rich quality content. Uh, uh, the technical deliberations across sessions were fantastic. I think the first uh, scientific topic uh, uh, for the Congress, uh, which is on the research and development incentives, R&D incentives, uh, there's a very specific question that was asked, is tax incentive for research and development uh, an effective tool and should governments really consider it over subsidies? Uh, well, the only answer was that uh, it's largely sometimes driven by the political considerations. Uh, but I think especially the developing countries uh, should take a uh, should refer to the work, great work that has been done in, in devising the R&D policy and perhaps consider non-tax incentives like subsidies uh, as well. Uh, practical protection of taxpayer rights, uh, I think, is a very, uh, uh, is a critical uh, aspect like Porus mentioned. Uh, one specific takeaway for India is the process of legislative making uh, and the, the, the taxpayer's protection uh, can effectively be managed if the public is involved more at the, at the 
time of framing of the legislation itself. Uh, in India, we have started doing that in the last couple of years, but I think a more robust institutional program perhaps would be very helpful for a country like India and uh, the other developing countries. Uh, BEPS, of course, uh, uh, I think OECD uh, uh, seems to be quite confident of uh, pushing through the multilateral instrument despite opposition from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, USA. But I think uh, most of the, uh, most of the uh, participants uh, are sort of reflecting a, a positive sentiment around BEPS. Uh, maybe this is uh, just a, a perception, but this is one impression that I gathered. Arun, so uh, on the whole, a very interesting conference and uh, from a very warm, hot uh, week, uh, finally, uh, we are on the fifth day and a nice uh, uh, weather outside. Any I hope. for Philip and Porus? Uh, sure. So, uh, uh, Porus, uh, uh, a specific point, uh, uh, and this came out in the today's discussion in the context of UK diverted profit tax. And one of the argument was that this law is not covered by the tax treaties. And perhaps where the BEPS uh, outcome will come, but most of the countries are taking some unilateral steps and are probably trying to consider or call such measures as outside of the tax treaties and therefore within the international framework. Do you think that this trend will continue uh, in the years to come? And is there a risk of the, the, the model convention which is present today uh, is partially uh, sort of uh, getting redundant uh, first to Porus and then to Philip? So I think that's why I think we all have a vested stake in the BEPS project, that it succeeds. Only to prevent this kind of unilateral actions as we see it from countries. Countries are going to do it, whether UK does it with diverted profits or Australia does it with other rules and fees and artificial avoidance. Countries are going to do it. And I think the risk of taxes which are put outside the treaties or which are unilateral is so, so great. So I think we have a vested interest that the project succeeds, both uh, ultimately and also on implementation, because right now the public mood, as it said, is, is against this kind of avoidance. There is a pressure. And if there is another financial crisis, it will be even greater. So I shudder to think what will happen then. Philip, you gave advice, legal advice on this. Are you precluded from talking? Well, you ask about the um, uh, uh, unilateral action um, here, and in a sense, um, if we had mechanisms for amending large numbers of treaties um, very swiftly, um, there would be no need for unilateral action because um, you, um, you, you only need to introduce taxes not covered by your treaties um, if the treaty um, cannot be amended um, sufficiently. Um, that again is where the multilateral instrument comes in, um, there, um, where um, if you can make these changes um, for all your treaties by agreement with all your treaty partners, then there's less need for um, countries to act unilaterally. Um, there. I have to correct you, I think, actually, on one point. You said the opposition of the US to the multilateral instrument. Uh, my understanding is that the United States um, has not um, decided to participate in the process because from their point of view, much of what it may achieve is already being achieved themselves. They, of course, have the US model. They have published um, revised versions. So it's not opposition, but it is that the US um, waits and stands back to see what comes out of um, the process. Certainly my own country, many others, are very supportive of the multilateral process sure. um, there. Um, uh, parts of BEPS actually require unilateral action, uh, and a number of countries, of course, have already gone ahead and introduced legislation um, in keeping with um, um, some of the um, uh, BEPS outcomes, and I think we will see more of that um, in the years to come. And uh, Philip, uh, before we toss for the last question for us, the next 12 months at uh, IFA, a lot, of, lot more of BEPS at all the conferences. And congratulations uh, to Porus for another two-year term at, uh, at the helm of IFA, and it's been a great two years. Thank you. Well, uh, there's no doubt that BEPS is going to occupy us, I think, for the next decade, probably, as the implementation happens. But IFA is going to have an extremely busy calendar next year. 
if I look at April and May, we might have not one, not two, but four regional conferences covering every single continent of, of the world. And I think that itself is wonderful. So we have a full calendar now in the fore part of the year and in the latter part of the year. So it's it's a very busy schedule. Satisfied with uh, with your term, uh, two years, happy with uh, you know the way things have gone, and you uh, been man you've been able to to do the things you set out to do. Very much. I think absolutely. I can't I can't be happier at this point in time. Oh great, uh, Philip, you're coming for the Tax Sutra Conclave in October for the keynote.